The following Simon & Schuster Audio Works program is another in a series of lectures recorded for audio by M. Scott Peck. Doctor, psychotherapist, lecturer, and author, Dr. Peck speaks frequently in major cities throughout the United States. His books include the bestseller The Road Less Traveled, People of the Lie, What Return Can I Make, The Different Drum, and the best-selling novel A Bed by the Window. The following lecture is entitled Addiction, the Sacred Disease. Here now is Dr. Peck. The title of this talk is Addiction, the Sacred Disease. And I would like to begin with a number of caveats. Uh, the first is that that title, like virtually all of my pearls, is stolen. In particular, it's uh, stolen once again from Jerry May's book, Will and Spirit, where he was the first one that I know ever to coin the term of addiction as a sacred disease. The second caveat uh, that I would like to give is that I think it is important for you to realize that the person talking to you is an addict, uh, in particular a perhaps almost hopeless nicotine addict. Uh, you know I uh, talk all about uh, self-discipline and whatnot, and I don't even have the self-discipline to stop smoking. Uh, I go past those parking spaces for the handicapped, and I think, ah, oh, they're for me. And uh, so it's important for you to realize that the person talking to you is a phony and a hypocrite. <laughs> the third caveat I would like to add is that drug use and abuse and addiction are multifaceted, multidimensional kinds of problems. Uh, as I told you earlier, as I go around the country, I have a kind of sub-ministry of trying to combat one-dimensional simplistic thinking. I am absolutely amazed at how one-dimensionally Americans think. And so even Harvard-educated physicians with IQs of 160 will routinely say to me about some obviously psychosomatic disorder, uh, which is it, darn it? Is it psychological or is it physical? As if it were beyond the capacity of their cerebral cortex to comprehend that a disease like the trunk of a tree might have more than one root at the same time. Actually, many diseases, and this includes the addictions, are psychosocio-spiritosomatic disorders. Uh, and I am going to be talking uh, this afternoon primarily about uh, the psychological and the spiritual aspects of addiction, but that does not mean that there are not profound biological roots to addiction and profound sociological roots. Uh, so, for instance, uh, alcoholism is a genetic inherited disorder. We know that now. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that because you have a gene for alcoholism that you will an alcoholic become, or once you become one that you have to continue uh, drinking, but it means simply that there are biological roots to this disorder. I'll give you another example of this and think in terms of the choice of drug of addiction. For instance, I, uh, well, I don't know as I'm an addict, I really like uh, what are called central nervous system depressants. I like my alcohol, uh, I like downers, uh, and yet I don't give a fig for uppers. And yet I know people who could kill for uppers. And so there are obviously biological determinants in these different kinds of choices of drugs. And finally, of course, sociological determinants. So where is addiction the greatest? But in our ghettos and our places of sociological hopelessness, uh, where people have got nothing better that they're able to do, able to do, than simply to get high and use whatever cheap grace is available. Uh, so uh, just because I'm going to be focusing on the psychological and the spiritual aspects of addictions, this does not mean that there are not profound biological and sociological roots to these disorders, which there are. Uh, finally, I am not going to be talking about the non-drug addictions. Uh, one way of looking at addictions is to look at them as forms of idolatry. Uh, 
And idolatry comes in many different forms, some of which we're quite accustomed to uh, recognize. So, for instance, uh, everyone would recognize the idolatry of money. Uh, and that is very real. I can assure you that there is nothing that interferes more with my prayer life than book sale statistics. <laughs> Uh, so that's real. But idolatry comes in other forms which we're not accustomed to think of in such terms. So, for instance, uh, one is the idolatry of family, where family togetherness becomes an idol, where it becomes more important to do or say what will keep the family matriarch or patriarch happy than it is to do or say what God wants you to do or say. And whenever we're in that position, we fall prey to the idolatry of family. How many of you in your own lives, for instance, have some experience with what I call the idolatry of family? Common problem, ain't it? And there are many of these kinds of idolatries, and so I'm not going to be talking about the non-drug idolatries or the non-drug addictions, which can be far more dangerous than the drug addictions. Things not only like addiction to money, but addiction to power, addiction to security. So please remember that in some ways the drug addictions are the least dangerous of addictions. Now I'd like to begin by talking about myth. To most lay people a myth means something that is untrue. But one of the advances that we have made in psychiatry and psychology over the past 60 years, thanks largely to the work of Carl Jung and his followers, people like Joseph Campbell, who you've been reading about or hearing uh, lately, is that we have learned that myth is myth precisely because it is true. What myths are are fairy tales found in culture after culture, age after age. And the reason that you will find that same fairy tale often worked out in slightly different ways in culture after culture, age after age, is precisely because it embodies some great kind of truth, virtually always about human nature. That's what myths are about, is about human nature. Now, to give you an idea of the distinction between an ordinary fairy tale, which is not likely ever to assume the status of myth, and a true myth, Santa Claus is a fairy tale. I'm sorry. <laughs> and so Santa Claus has only been around for a couple hundred years and is only known in about one-fifth of the globe. Dragons, on the other hand, are a myth. So long before anyone ever cooked up Santa Claus, Christian monks were illuminating dragons in their painstaking manuscripts in European monasteries. And so were Taoist monks in China. And so are Buddhist monks in Japan, and so are Hindus in India, and so are Muslims in Arabia. And so we have to ask, why dragons? Why are these mythical creatures so extraordinarily international and ecumenical? And the reason is that they are human being symbols. They are snakes with wings, worms that can fly, and that's us. And so reptilian-like, we slink close to the ground and we are mired in the mud of our sinful proclivities and narrow-minded cultural prejudices. And yet, like birds, we have the capacity to soar in the heavens and transcend those same sinful proclivities and transcend those same narrow-minded cultural prejudices. And so that's us. We're a group of dragons gathered together here this afternoon. Now, I think that one of the reasons for the popularity of dragons is that they are perhaps the simplest of all myths. But note that even here, they are two-sided, multi-dimensional creatures. And this is one of the reasons for myths, that they are necessary to capture the often multi-dimensional, often paradoxical aspects of human nature. Now, you cannot get in trouble in believing in myths because myths are true, whereas you can get in trouble in believing in simplistic one-dimensional fairy tales like President Reagan. <laughs> now, of all the world's great myths, one is one that you are quite familiar with, and that is Genesis 3, the story of Adam and Eve and the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the garden of Eden. Now, myths can work by what Freud, in relation to dreams, called condensation. 
a dream can condense into it uh, not just one meaning, but often two, sometimes even three meanings rolled in, up into the same dream. Well, this myth, this great story of Genesis 3, has not just one thing, not two, not three or four, but more than a dozen profound things to teach us about human nature. And I'm going to just be able to touch upon a few of them. But one of the things that it is a myth about, while the creationists may not like it, are there any creationists uh, here in the audience this afternoon? Any closet creationists? <laughs> well, if there are, I remind you that myth is true, and so Genesis 3 is true. Not necessarily literally true, but metaphorically true. And one of the things that it is a myth about is about evolution. Not that God didn't have a hand in evolution. Indeed, I think that he, she, they very much did. But specifically, it is a myth about how we human beings evolved into consciousness. Because the first thing that happened after we had eaten of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is that we became conscious. And having become conscious, we became conscious of ourselves as separate from each other and separate from the other creatures and separate from the rest of nature. And having become conscious of ourselves, we became self-conscious. So how was it, for instance, that God knew that we had eaten of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? He, she, they knew precisely because we had become self-conscious, right? Or shy. Or modest. Now, this consciousness of ourselves as separate individuals as separate from each other, separate from the other creatures, and separate from the rest of nature. This sense of separation is symbolized by us having been kicked out of Eden, out of that warm, fuzzy state of oneness with the rest of nature and the rest of the world. Now, another terribly important thing that this myth teaches us is that we cannot go back to Eden, can we? Because as you will remember, the way is barred by cherubims with flaming swords. And so what Genesis 3 teaches us is that we cannot go back to Eden. We can only go forward through the desert into deeper and ever deeper levels of consciousness for our salvation. Now this is a terribly important truth. Because a great deal of human psychopathology, including the abuse of drugs and addictions, arises out of the attempt to get back to Eden. So, for instance, why do we drink at cocktail parties except to diminish our shyness or our self-consciousness? And so it is that Kurt Vonnegut's son, Mark, in writing about his own mental illness and drug abuse, entitled his book, The Eden Express. And indeed, if we take just the right amount of alcohol or just the right amount of pot or just the right amount of coke or some combination thereof, for a couple of minutes or for a couple of hours, if we're lucky, we may regain that lost, fuzzy state of oneness with the rest of nature and feel like we've kind of come home. But the feeling never lasts for long and the price usually isn't worth it. It is a form of what Dietrich Bonhoeffer used to refer to as cheap grace. Because the reality as Genesis 3 tells us, is we cannot go back to Eden. We can only go forward through the desert into deeper and ever deeper levels of consciousness for our salvation. Now, I talked about this feeling of getting back to Eden as a feeling of coming home. And I think that one way of looking at addicts is that they are people who want to, who yearn to go home more than most. And this yearning to go home can be terribly powerful. Uh, to give you an example of how powerful, <clears throat> and this may also give you an example of some of the biological roots to this, one of the things that I've noticed over the years that's uh, uh, quite unusual about alcoholics is the extraordinary clarity with which they will often remember their first drink. Uh, this was brought home to me one day I was seeing an alcoholic serviceman who had been raised in a fundamentalist home where demon rum was preached against 
And actually, alcoholics are more likely to come from such homes than those that have a more liberal attitude toward alcohol. But as a result of this upbringing, he didn't have his first drink until the age of 23, when in the company of a couple of army buddies, he went into a bar and had a couple of whiskeys, and then he said to me, and then for the first time in my life, I knew what it was like to feel normal. Well, that's pretty powerful stuff. Again, that may be speak to some of the genetic etiology of alcoholism, where there may be a gene where people cannot feel normal until they have a couple of drinks in them. So I think that addicts, whether biologically or spiritually or whatnot, are people who want to go home more than most. And there are two ways of looking at this yearning to go home. One is to look at it as a regressive kind of phenomenon, a yearning to not only go back to Eden, but crawl back into the womb. But the other way to look at it is as a potentially progressive kind of phenomenon, and that in this yearning to go home, addicts are people that have a more powerful calling than most to God and yearning for the Spirit. How many of you here might have some possible awareness of the role that Carl Jung played in the founding of Alcoholics Anonymous? Oh, great uh, number of you. Please bear with me if I repeat it for the others. Uh, Jung had a patient back in the 1920s, an alcoholic man, and after about a year of working with him, Jung threw up his hands and said, listen, he said, you're just wasting your money uh, with me. I, uh, I don't know how to help you. I can't help you. And this man said to Jung, he said, well, is there no hope for me then? Nothing you can suggest. And Jung said, well, the only thing that I can suggest is that you might seek a religious conversion that I have heard reports of a couple of people who underwent religious conversions and stopped drinking. And there's a certain reason that makes a certain kind of psychodynamic sense to me. Well, this man, perhaps because he had a passive dependent personality disorder, I don't know, uh, took Jung at his word and went out seeking a religious conversion. And someone once said, seek and you shall find. And after about six years, he found one and underwent a religious conversion and stopped drinking. And shortly after doing that, he bumped into one of his old drinking buddies, a man by the name of Ebby. And Ebby said, hey, have a drink. And he said, no, I don't drink anymore. And Ebby said, what do you mean you don't drink anymore? You're a hopeless alcoholic, just like me. And this man explained the story about how Jung had told him to seek a religious conversion. He did, and he had stopped drinking. And uh, Ebby thought that was pretty neat, so he went out looking for a religious conversion. It took him about two years, and he found one, and he stopped drinking. And not too long after that, uh, Ebby was in Akron, Ohio one night and dropped in to see his old drinking buddy, Bill W. And Bill W. said, hey, Ebby, have a drink. And Ebby said, no, I don't drink anymore. And Bill W. said, what do you mean you don't drink anymore? You're a hopeless alcoholic, just like me. And Ebby recounted how he had met this patient of Jung's who'd undergone a religious conversion, then he'd looked for a religious conversion. Well, Bill W. thought that was pretty neat, so he went out looking for a religious conversion, took him a couple of weeks, and then he started the first AA meeting. Well, about 20 years later, after AA really began to get off the ground, and it really didn't until the 1950s, Bill W. wrote to Jung to tell him, Jung, the role that he had inadvertently played in the founding of AA. And Jung wrote back to him an absolutely fascinating letter. Uh, first, he said he was terribly glad that Bill W. had written to him. He was glad to know that his patient had, uh, uh, had done well. He was glad to know the role he had inadvertently played. But also, he said uh, he was particularly glad because there were not many people that he, Jung, could talk to about such things. But that it had for some years occurred to him that it is perhaps no accident that we traditionally refer to alcohol as spirits. And that perhaps alcoholics are people that have a greater thirst for the spirit than other people. And that perhaps alcoholism was a spiritual disorder, or better yet, a spiritual condition. So there are two ways to look at this yearning that addicts have 
to go home. One is as a regressive, infantile kind of phenomenon to crawl back into the womb, but the other is as a progressive phenomenon, as a yearning for the spirit and for God. And I think that both of these ways are true. Uh, and that it would uh, be wrong to totally disregard uh, the regressive aspects. But nonetheless, in working with people, the greatest payoff generally comes in emphasizing the positive. And so in working with addicts, the greatest payoff comes not from emphasizing the regressive aspects of the disorder, but rather the progressive ones in treating them. And what I'm going to do now is talk about the treatment of addictions, and I'm going to be using the AA model because AA is the model. Now, back in my psychiatry training some 30 years ago when I knew much more than I know now, <laughs> uh, we psychiatrists already knew that AA had a much better track record in working with alcoholics than we psychiatrists had. But the reason that we thought this was so, the reason that AA worked better was because it worked as a substitute for the bar. Uh, that we knew that alcoholics had what we called aural personality disorders and that they would get together at AA meetings and that they would yap a lot and they would drink a lot of coffee and they'd smoke a lot of cigarettes and in that way they would uh, satisfy their aural needs and that was why AA worked. And I am afraid, even ashamed, to tell you that the majority of psychiatrists, including those who are training new psychiatrists, continue to believe that that is the way that AA works as a substitute addiction. Now, I do not want to say that there is absolutely nothing to it uh, that I would say that one quarter of one percent of the reason that AA works is because it is a substitute addiction. But the real reason that the 12-step programs work, that AA works, is because of something called the program. And the program works for three reasons. The first reason that it works is that it is the only program that there is for religious conversion. That it teaches people why to go forward through the desert, namely toward God. It is the only program that there is for religious conversion. Now, people in AA sometimes object to that word religious because it seems to smack of the organized church. And so if you want in your mind, you can substitute spiritual for religious. Uh, also, uh, people in AA will often soft pedal the uh, religious aspect uh, in order to seduce new members in who are threatened by it. Uh, but nonetheless, a core, very core of the 12 steps uh, is the concept of the higher power and God. And it works because it is a program of spiritual or religious conversion. Indeed, this is uh, one way you might regard, if you so choose, AA as being the most successful church in this country today. Any other denomination would envy its extraordinary, phenomenal growth. And they're incredibly smart. I mean, they're so smart that they don't even bother about budgets and buildings. In fact, they use existing church buildings uh, for their meetings. This is one of the positive roles which the institutional church plays today to host AA meetings. Uh, about a year ago, I was speaking in my own home state in Connecticut in a modest-sized church. And during the break time, wandering around the halls, I looked at the bulletin board and came to realize that that church hosted some 27 AA meetings each week, along with four Al-Anon meetings and two Overeaters Anonymous meetings. So the first reason that the program works is because it is a program of religious conversion that teaches people why to go forward through the desert, namely toward God. 